everything is interoperable. Well, surprisingly enough, if you manage to listen to that, okay, you'll hear yeah. that it's actually decoding very well. Ten, nine, eight. Tuning now for maximum brightness. The yeah, Amber Radio, is, there's just so many facets for everyone. I mean, it's yeah, not right. just talking, yeah. it's um, uh, technical. Uh, so there's people like Morse code, there's people who like digital, there's people who like to work um, weak signal, like very low power, people who like to chase other radio stations, there's people who enjoy television, there's people who enjoy um, bouncing signals off the moon, high altitude balloons, there's all these little itches that can be scratched by little facets of amateur radio, that's one of the great things about it. There is to be a balloon launch in about 15 minutes time. Well, this long string stretched across the oval appears to be the payload that will dangle from the balloon. The payload. We're viewing personnel. We are just starting to fill the balloon. We're seeing the lift off at 2 p.m. It's one of the ways we can control the flight profile. By uh, controlling the amount of lift, we control how fast the balloon goes up. And uh, that affects, of course, the flight path through the atmosphere. It's one of the few controls that we've got. The other control we've got is the size of parachute that we use. So in this case, we're using a small chute to bring the, uh, the balloon down faster than usual. It should land at about six or seven metres a second. Just attaching the balloon now to the payloads. As I said, that's the, uh, the cut-down payload. The way the cut-down payload works is uh, we can command it from the ground over a radio link. But, uh, applies current to a little nichrome wire, a little hot wire, and that hot wire will melt through the string and allow the balloon to detach from the, uh, the payloads that it's carrying. That way we can control within a few kilometres of where we're actually going to land it. So if we find it uh, in the predictor that the flight's going to land somewhere where we can't recover it, um, we can actually elect to terminate the flight early and uh, therefore we can recover our payloads. The uh, launch site to uh, hand off here today. We, uh, have to be somewhat careful about where the uh, Adelaide Approach air routes are. Fortunately, we're uh, far enough away from Adelaide Approach that um, CASA has given us approval to launch from here at Handorf. Roger, so we're just waiting for air traffic control. Whoops. Wouldn't it be good to send the payload into the air with the front door open? Uh, so I should probably describe the payloads are basically all made out of polystyrene and gaffer tape. Nothing high tech here. The high tech is in the uh, electronic design itself. One of the key criteria we've got with all of these is to make them as lightweight as possible, so that we can carry as many payloads as possible for the uh, for the amount of gas that we do. Good to see the uh, surface winds here have dropped right off. So it's very nice when we can put the balloon up and it just sits there nice and vertical. Certainly makes life a lot easier. We're at T minus 30 seconds and holding, as NASA likes to say. Just like a miniature space mission, it, it has a lot of aspects that are very similar to a space mission. There's a lot of planning that goes in, there's a lot of preparation, a lot of checks, a lot of waiting, more waiting. Not to be, uh, Ringing CASA shortly and uh, finding out where our uh, authority to launch is. So it's going to move it into a, uh, a safe place in the middle of the oval to lift off. But it looks like at this stage it's going to be a beautiful lift off straight up. The balloon when it gets going at times we'll probably hit about 100 kilometres an hour across the ground. Might hit a little faster, depends on the high altitude winds. Maximum height for the flight today should be approximately 30 kilometres, or somewhere approximating 100,000 feet. It's about a third of the way into uh, the height that they classify as actual space. We call this area near space. Uh, we have a 5 to 10 minute delay because the aircraft is in the vicinity, so yeah, 5 to 10 minute hold on the launch. Okay, so we need to wait our turn. This will be our 45th heavy launch. There's been a few other micro launches as well. On 10, 9, 
eight, seven, six, five, four, three, two, one. Smile and say goodbye. Well, this is Grand VK5GR, one of the organisers for the event and also uh, involved with the Amateur Radio Experimenters Group and Project Horus, which just had a successful lift-off. Uh, how, many, how many have you done so far, Grant? That makes number 45. 45, so. wonderful. So there'll be people right now scrambling to try and find it. Matthew should be hopping in his car over here in just a minute. Um, he'll be off with the tracking crew. Excellent. Um, hopefully he'll get it before sundown. So okay, so what direction or where do we think we'll find it? We'll eventually end up east of here, mm. um, about 150 kilometres downrange. Okay, have have any ended up in the Spencer Gulf or somewhere? Uh, we've lost one in St Vincent's Gulf. Yep. That was back in the early days. Mm. Uh, and we let one go that we kind of thought we'd lose over the Curl. Yep. But the really spectacular one that we lost, uh, it went up and it floated. And, it floated, um, wonderful. About 2,500 kilometres later, it landed off the coast of Wollongong. It's about 40 minutes after the balloon launch, and this screen shows its progress. It's heading almost due east. And this is Mark, VK5QI, behind the balloon launch, or one of those in the Amateur Radio Experimenters Group. How you going, guys? This is my chase car. Yeah, yeah let's have a look inside. Uh, right, well, unfortunately, there isn't much inside the moment. Oh, but in the back, there's, there's plenty of stuff. That's where all the fun stuff is. Yeah. Oh, and is this yours as well? This is not mine. Oh, um, well. Okay, so, uh, chase car, what do we need? We need a, need a computer. This is for fox hunting. This is for balloon hunting. Balloon Fox hunting. hunting is another order of magnitude more complicated. Though it might not look it. Anyway, core of a chase computer. To a core of a chase car, we need to have some kind of computer. So I've got an Intel i3 uh, NUC, little mini PC. Uh, that is fed from a number of software-defined radios. I've got a splitter and switching network to allow me to choose different antennas yeah. if I need to. Mm. Um, numerous radios for comms. I have a 4G modem for internet connectivity. Uh -huh. uh, HF radio because going out in the country, HF's always yeah. good fun. I've even got a Raspberry Pi because everyone's <laughs> got to have a Raspberry Pi in the car. It's inside this little box here. That's actually decoding the telemetry from the mm. cut down payload. Mm. And because overkill is everything in AREG, I have a cavity filter. Okay, so the process is you decode the telemetry and then you try and drive as fast as you can to it? Or? Basically, yes. That's pretty much it. We actually use predictions. Uh, yeah. So we do a forward prediction of where the balloon is going to go based on current telemetry. Mm. We drive it there. Because mm. where it is and where it's going can be very, very different things. Mm. The balloon may head out to the east, come back again, or go backwards and forwards a number mm. of times, which has happened. Uh, so right now, well, today's launch is pretty simple. The balloon's going east, and it's going to keep mm. on going east until it bursts, and it will go a bit further east and then land. So we've currently got two chase teams uh, barreling out along the um, highway t uh, towards Lamaru and the Victorian border, yep. hoping to track, hoping to recover the payload. And then when you get really close, um, what happens then? Yeah. The positioning is pretty good down to the ground. Yep. Um, we'll generally use uh, the position reported by the payload. However, the Rudy payload is very easy to DF. Mm. So, for example, I've got a three-element Yagi in the car, ah, yes. and I've got a sniffer in the front of the car, which I can use to kind of, kind of so find it. So, on what frequencies does the each balloon transmit on? Like you mentioned, Ritty on 70 centimetres. Okay, so Ritty is always, almost always on 434.650, mm. uh, um, 70 centimetres. Um, when it is also on 70 centimetres, uh, mm. on 441.2, and the cut-down payload is also on 70 centimetres, mm. on 431.65. Mm. Mm. Um, Today we have the, the crossbar repeater fly, which has an uplink on two meters, but mm. we almost always use 70 centimeters. Yep. Keeps the antennas small. Yes. We've got more than enough spectrum to play with. Yes. Uh, none of the payloads transmit more than 50 milliwatts. Okay. That's yep. what we need. Mm. Uh, the Ridi payload 10 milliwatts, mm. the Wenet payload 50, cut down payload about 25 mm. milliwatts. And is there ATV transmissions from it? No, ATV is very hard to do from a balloon mm. payload. So real like, for example, DTBS or DTBT is very hard to do. Uh, because you need linear, well, DVBS you don't quite need linearity, mm. but you need 
reasonably ish linear amplifiers. Yeah. You need a lot of power as well. Yeah, the power would be uh, the killer. And the issue we have is not so much, I mean, you think, oh, it's really cold up there, right? It's mm. going to be fine, mm. but no, there's no air to transfer the heat mm. away. So once you get above about 15 kilometers or so, the payload will overheat. Oh. So, hence why we ended up going with the Wenet imaging system, which uses the low, uses 115 kilobits per second FSK, and transmits bugger all power, mm. because it doesn't need to. Uh, so, yeah, no ATV yet. If these ATV guys can design, design up a payload that'll be nice and small and nice and um, lightweight and low power consumption, then we'll fly it. That's wonderful. So, yeah, hopefully we can get the payloads back today. Oh, well, thanks, off. thanks, Mark. Now, people wanting more information, uh, they can go to your website. Uh, the AREG website, yep. A R E G. AREG.org.au. Yeah. Uh, we'll There's no URL on there, but AREG.org.au, and you'll find out more information. AREG.org.au. Make sure you visit it. Fantastic website. No worries, thank you. Okay. okay, we're about 90 minutes after the balloon launch and it's continued its easterly journey. This is the multi-band magnetic loop by Steve of VK5 SFA. Just leaving the, uh, the plastic on the outside of the waveguide affect its length? It, it helps you because tarnish is your enemy, okay. you don't want it. So that's a polyethylene jacket, very, very, very t tough. And if you peel that away, it's a shiny bright copper under it. And that's, you want shiny bright copper. You don't want resistance in your system. That's no, coming through a 14 to 1 reduction gear box, which takes you down to 0.13 degrees per step. And you need that granularity when you're playing around with it. I developed some software in conjunction with a young man who works in the that's the simplest form, and the really, really big negative with this system is that the moment you go off frequency to another frequency, the antenna cup goes straight out of resonance, you don't hear them anymore, and your VSWR is in for them. Then, moving a little bit further along here, um, this is a Raspberry Pi in this little box, and also the stepper motor driver uh, board, which actually converts what my software tells it to do to drive that stepper motor onto that antenna out there. So, everything is interoperable, and there's the other thing I'd like to show you. So, if we move the VFO, yeah. it instantly changes it on Ham Radio Deluxe, it instantly changes it on my controller software, and instantly adjusts the antenna, so it doesn't matter where you are. I designed this antenna to go down to the 60 meter band, so I'm not finished with this one yet. Um, as soon as the 60 meter band's available, I'll be honest. So, 7 megahertz is zero, and then all you do is you uh, wind your, put your radio onto 7.1, and then manually using these little buttons, you can advance the stepper motor independent of the software until you find the VSWR minima. The moment you find that minima, you just simply hit the little add button and it puts it into the database. So it now knows at 7.1, advance exactly 1,020 steps. Now the really cool part that came about is there was a mathematician um, in the United States that developed this thing called a cubic spline interpolation and all it does is simply joins the dots. It's, it's just a beautiful little piece of software. He made it freely available to anybody who wanted it, ready to compile, and we just stitched it into the software. So all you need to do is you need to put three data points in and, and even, even, even better, it actually draws you a complete graph of exactly what the hell is going on. You hit the zero step button, completely recalibrated, and, and away you go. We also like to talk to educators and how about that, Peter? Is that a good spot? Hi, this is VK3YSP Joe, who's involved in a school amateur radio club project. And can you plant this one for me? Up at the bush, see the bush over there? It's just beside the tennis courts. I've got the honour of hiding a little concealed transmitter. You can see it's in camouflage. This is for the kids of Handorf Primary School to find. So this is Brian, VK3YNG's Sniffer 4. If anything, it's far too easy to use. <laughs> it finds uh, the beacons in no time. The kids absolutely enjoy it. Okay, so this is just put in the back of a car and transported? And yeah, so transported and we use these at rallies. Okay. Awesome. 
Tips is active. Yeah. So, yes, I'm talking to David VK5 LSB. That's right. And uh, it's a great event here and uh, great to see uh, you flying the flag for Wyson. Yeah, we've got, we got lots of other stuff as well. Yeah. So we got actual single unit ones as well. Yeah. And, uh, which is just uh, on the average creeks and but a lot of these are actual commercial creeks. So okay, yeah. yeah. And can it be set up to be a cross band repeater? Yeah, that's right, yeah. 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 One of the great things about these large WA conventions is they attract amateurs from all over Australia. We have here Andrew VK6AS, who is one of the team behind News West, one of the most widely listened to amateur broadcasts in Australia. So Andrew, how long have you been with News West? I've been broadcasting with them for about three years now, Peter. I, uh, it's a challenge. We love putting our radio news together every week on a, for a Sunday. And since I started and with developments, we now get out to multiple places far beyond Western Australia, pretty much all over Australia. And with the wonders of the internet also uh, listened to uh, all around the world. And uh, how many people are involved in producing the news each Sunday? There are four of us, a team of four, and uh, uh, sometimes when people go away we get down to uh, a few less than that, uh, but it's usually four of us, uh, together of course with Roy who puts together his helpline which is a 30 plus year old institution. We started I believe uh, WA News back in 1926, so we've got a pretty long uh, long history of doing that, uh, Peter. Mm -hmm. uh, it's a challenge to get people to provide us with information, yes. but what we do get is usually high quality related to amateur radio. And have you resorted to making things up when there hasn't been enough material? We're definitely not into false news. No, we, we have a we have a lot of fun with, uh, with getting stories, um, but we have a a, a common theme that we really want them to be related to things that are happening in WA and are of relevance mm. to amateurs in VK6. And uh, how many um, uh, callbacks would you get every week? Um, that's an interesting question because it's lies, damn lies and statistics. Mm. Uh, we reckon we get um, several hundred uh, every, uh, every weekend. Mm. So now if people want to listen to news rest even if they are in WA is there a website they can go to yeah for everything to do with amateur radio in uh, VK6 vk6.net that's got all the sources there it's got all the broadcasts got all the information of activities that go on in our state wonderful thanks Andrew a pleasure to have you on VK3YE's YouTube channel uh, thank you very much Peter just to say that the this a uh, day, couple of days in Harndorf have been absolutely fantastic. A real credit to the VK5 clubs who put it all together. Absolutely yep. fantastic. Thanks. Everyone would agree. Wonderful. Thanks, Andrew. Thank you. An off-centre dipole, I think, for 40 metres. That's been used for the Olivia transmissions. have Paul VK5PAS and Hello, Paul Peter. is a dynamo of enthusiasm when it comes to parks. Yes. So how long have you been doing it Paul? Uh, I first got started probably about four and a half years yep. ago Peter. Mm. Uh, it really, I was sparked or my interest was sparked because I worked a guy on a summit mm -hmm. in the UK and then shortly after I worked a Italian station in a park and I thought gee this sounds pretty good fun. So I bought myself a little cheap uh, Chinese version of the buddy stick. Oh yes, yeah. Uh, and went out and activated the park. But that was the one and only time I ever used that antenna. It, go, it, uh, it disappeared after that. And I bought myself a link dipole. And gee, I don't know, maybe 400 activations I've done. So I 400 guess. separate parks. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That's amazing. And, and it's a lot of fun. And how many parks are there in South Australia? There are 250. Seven, I believe, mm. conservation parks mm. and about uh, I think uh, 19 national parks. Yep. So there's no shortage of parks. A great, great thing about the parks is the, the amount of activity it's generated. It's been incredible. Oh, it's amazing. Huge. Yeah. Last last year, um, WWF mm. has been going for four years now in Australia. In the four year life of the program, I've sent out about two and a half thousand certificates fairly heavy. It's uh, a 44 amp hour power pack, a commercially made product by a company called Matson. Uh, so in essence it's actually two 22 amp hour slab batteries, but running that at about uh, 40 watts during my activation, then I generally try and top it up a little bit if it's a nice sunny day with... Uh 
and uh, you also put together uh, Out and About in VK5 yeah. every month, so yeah, yeah. Um, that, that keeps um, people in touch with yeah. all the park out, happening. Out and About's probably been going for around about two years mm. now, and it just started off as a little newsletter to hopefully try and promote a bit of activity yeah. here in, in South Australia, and now we've got readers mm. all around the world, and it's fantastic. So, yeah, so if people want to look at Out and About, it's available free, where can yeah. they find it? Yeah, they can go to the uh, either my website, mm. which is vk5pas.com, yeah. or they can go to the Worldwide Flora and mm. Fauna website, mm. www.ffaustralia.com, mm. or uh, the VK5 Parks Awards site, which yeah. is vk5parks.com, and download it, yeah. and have a read, and yeah. see what you think. Yeah. Also on show is the new Parks and Peaks mobile phone app by Sue VK5 AYL. Well, the app is uh, from the Parks and Peaks website. It downloads data from mm. the website and it also uploads data. Okay. How long did it take you to develop? Uh, well, I started learning mm. how to write iPhone apps two mm. years ago. Mm. And I was using uh, Swift. Mm. Uh, which was a new um, language for Apple. So it's a pro programming language for yes. apps. Okay, yep. And it's open source now. Okay, yeah. But when I started using it, it was just released, and that was yep. version one. Okay. Um, and they've been upgrading that uh, Swift. Now it's version three. Mm. So every time they uh, released a new version, I even use beta versions. Mm. Every time they release a new version, it would break all my code mm. and just be a sea of red mm. everywhere. But eventually, it became more stable. Okay. So the um, Parks and Peaks app that came out last night was it last yes. night that it was released? Have you been able to see how many downloads there've been? Uh, I have. Um, I think it was like forty something. Forty. That time. that's impressive. Yeah. You know, it shows that there's a demand. Um, that's right. So it's right. wonderful. So I hope it contributes to activity. Yes. And uh, um, thank you for your contribution um, no to the amateur radio scene and a great talk last night as well. Oh, thank you. Really enjoyed it. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> uh, I'm just curious, is Sari on 10 gigahertz or 47? 10. 47, 5 gigs, 3.4, 2.4, 1296. Oh. And 122 gigs. And this is, um, is the remote station just on the other side or are they further? I'll, I'll just be talking to Dave down in the other tent down there. He's just been so slow, so he's taking off one on the other. He just unplugged his reference and went about 45 kc low. And what's the degree of attenuation by the time the signal gets back here? We've not been fried, are we? <laughs> well, it's about 5 microwatts and 122 g. <laughs> not a lot of power there. <laughs> so this is all stuff you built yourself? Yeah. Oh, except for that. Okay. Stick your carrier on 47 and let me just line the thing up a bit. So what's the furthest contact you've had on 47? 47, about 90 kilometers. 90, wow. Sounds like VK5 has a lot of enthusiasm and yeah. the microwaves and... That's, that's yeah. a 47 gig transmitter as well in that box. Yeah. I've got two, I've got two of them. The Elizabeth Club have really... The Elizabeth having a radio mm. club have been... That's their interest. So this transverter, does it convert right up from 432 or is there an in intermediate? No, 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 uh, no, that's... 47088 is the frequency we use. Less... 448 megahertz mm. is the local oscillator frequency. Right. Divided by four is what comes out of this. Right, great. So that comes out of there, it goes into this gadget at the back here, which is a, a, a times two, mm. up to 23 point something gigahertz, which is amplified there to about 100 milliwatts. And that just goes into a diode. Mm. That's all it's in, a in diode mixer. Box. It's just a diode. The diode multiplies it by two yeah. and mixes it with 144 mega and okay. radiates yeah. about 150 microwatts. Out of mm. Not milliwatts, but microwatts. microwatts yeah. But the antenna would have a fair amount of gain. Um, it's probably close to 40 dB. 40 gain, dB. Yeah. This frequency. So I'll just stick the beacon on while I change it over. Yeah. 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 I call it the Optigun. <laughs> right. So it's got a uh, 
mobile phone headset attached to it. When it's when it's off, it's in receive mode. It uses one LED, one red LED, because LEDs work the same. They work as photo diodes as well as LEDs. In fact, they have to So you wander around with this up and down all over the place. People looking very strange as if you've got some. <laughs> Shark RF hotspot there. Yep. And that's a DVAP hotspot there. So I'm running two DVAPs connected to the different system. Into the D Star world. Oh, okay. Yep. So that one's connected to Reflector 23. So he's looking at all those connected on things. Uh, that's connected at the moment to the local repeater, yep. uh, which is the other side of the hill. So, so that's, uh, I can connect it. This morning I had it connected to Reflector 30, which is in Atlanta. So we get to yesterday's drive time. Right? So, yeah. Mm. So is there much D-Star activity in Adelaide? Uh, it's used regularly. Okay, uh, yeah. There's probably about half a dozen people who use it regularly, about 60 registrations. Okay. I'm talking with Ben, VK5VB, and we've just been talking about D-Star here in Adelaide, 40 metre direct conversion. Yes, direct conversion. This is from Daryl, VK5JDS. This is a Dick Smith Commander, a kit from the early 1980s, a 2 metre FM rig and a very nice homebrew double sideband transceiver. This is 3DV and this looks like the little box developed by David VK5 DGR and that's been used to success to plug into an HF transceiver and be able to transmit voice digital. The broadcast uh, as received is suffering a lot of selective fading. This yep. normally should be sitting nice and level mm -hmm. with each of these carriers, these seven carriers on yep. each side of the sync signal, sitting fairly <laughs> level. But because the conditions are so mm -hmm. poor, it's it's really dancing around. Did that affect the broadcast quality? Well, much? surprisingly enough, if you manage to listen to that, okay, you'll hear yeah. that it's actually decoding very well. Seven, seven one seven seven on Sunday mornings, morning, ten thirty Melbourne time. Ten thirty Melbourne time. Yeah. And there's a article about it in Amateur Radio magazine. So if you've got the September 2016 issue, there's an article by John VK3 IC and Peter VK3 RV, who is right here today. So that's wonderful to have you here, Peter. Thank you. And Peter. you've also been um, busy with a WA history book on uh, on wartime oh, yes. radio. Yes, yes, it's um, now available. And, uh, it's gathering a lot of interest. Excellent. Um, so if people want to buy it, can they go to the WA yes, website? Yes, it's, it's available from the, uh, the, the website. If you are interested in the book, wia.org.au, and you can order a copy from there. So this is a modified code in 6924. Uh, modified by yourself, Barry? Yes, I've modified it. Yeah, it's uh, now got a uh, N3ZI DDS in it. Oh yes, I've got one of those. They work and, uh, well. It's set up to run from 1.8 through to uh, 20 metres. Excellent. Have you had many contacts today? Uh, what? Three or four. Yeah. Good. And you're just using an N-fed half wave, is it? Just a, yeah, random just a little, little wire. Random, wire random length. Tuning now for maximum brightness. Uh, VK5 Bravo Whiskey. Now this is a Kodan man pack made here in South Australia, I believe. Yeah. The Kodan company is based here. I'm just going to plug in an APRS dongle. So we'll turn this on and uh, as soon as it has a GPS lock, it will start transmitting our position. So great to have a lot of people here. You must be really pleased with how the weekend's gone. I think it really is the case of the weather gods have si um, mm. smiled on us and mm. everybody's had a wonderful time yep. looking around all the displays. Mm. So I hope a lot of people have found the magic of radio. Okay, thanks Grant. Wonderful to talk to you. Thank you, Peter. Amateur radio is not only just magic, it is healthy. It makes you walk. <laughs> <laughs> and enjoy the fact that you're alive. <laughs>